Home prices in Canada's largest city fell last month as higher borrowing costs took a toll on affordability. Data from the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board shows home prices fell 2.2 percent in November compared to the month before, while home sales saw the first increase since May. Meanwhile, speaking about affordable housing today at a press conference, Housing Minister Sean Fraser said options such as co-op apartments are a unique solution to Canada's housing crisis for many families, but have lacked serious investment from the federal government for decades. Canada has uh, less than 4% of its housing stock offered outside of the market to ensure that low-income families have a place to live. Uh, for what it's worth, the OECD average is about 8%. Uh, as a result of a sustained lack of investment for decades, uh, Canada now is facing a shortage of affordable housing in the ecosystem that manifests itself in a lot of very challenging ways. Now, we can change that, but not without sustained direct investment by the federal government in affordable housing. Well, turning now to the rental market, roughly 1.4% of Canada's housing stock is listed on short-term rental sites. At the same time, renters in Canada are struggling with high rents and low vacancy rates. Those are for the long-term rentals. A new report from Desjardins says adding restrictions to short-term rentals in Canada could help improve housing supply and affordability. For more on this, let's bring in Randall Bartlett. He's Senior Director of Canadian Economics at Desjardins. Randall, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Jacqueline. So this is really interesting because we did hear from the federal government in their fall fiscal update about some changes when it comes to uh, what you can claim in your, your taxes as a, um, when it comes to expenses around rentals. And so if you had a short-term rental, you wouldn't be able to, to claim those expenses the same as you would with a long-term rental. Um, but really shining the spotlight on these short-term rentals and whether or not they have uh, an impact on the long-term rental market. And there has been discussion uh, around that, whether that it really is having an impact on the market itself. So you dug into a lot of data across different cities. Um, and, and what were you able to find? Yeah, so my co-author, Kerry Norman, and I did a sort of deep dive on looking at what the research says uh, by analyzing data across uh, cities around the world. And essentially what it found is that uh, the proliferation of short-term rentals in uh, in various, uh, various markets uh, has uh, led to um, a positive increase in the uh, the rent charged for longer term rentals and um, also uh, you know positive impact on home prices as well which has helped to uh, erode uh, erode affordability although when it comes to the the mar market housing the impact is is much less significant yeah, we have a couple of your graphs, and I want to bring one up that shows uh, the, the revenue that investors, or rather, that uh, landlords uh, make. I, I should make an assumption there that they're in this for the investment part of it. But in any case, the, the owners um, would earn uh, when it comes to short-term rental versus long-term rental. So underscoring perhaps the appeal, I, uh, Randall, here, when it comes to why someone would be choosing to list their, um, you know, home, room, or what have you as, as a short-term versus the, the long-term rental? Well, that's it. I mean, I think everybody here is, uh, is, is, you know, behaving in a way that makes uh, makes perfect sense, really responding to incentives the way that they're set up. And so when it comes to things like short-term rentals, I think landlords are better able to adjust pricing to reflect uh, the cost that they're incurring to uh, to offer those rentals. Whereas in the situation of a long-term rental in many cities, they are constrained on uh, the size of the rent increases that they can bring in. So it doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the rise in costs that they're facing from inflation and higher interest rates. And so it's, uh, you know, it's understandable what the appeal is for putting uh, putting rental uh, rental units on the uh, short term rental market as opposed to long term. So I mean that's interesting, Randall, because then if someone weren't able to uh, rent out their unit as a short term rental anymore, let's say a rule came into place that didn't allow them to do that, um, they wouldn't necessarily be able to get what they would need to cover their costs if they were to go to the the long-term rental market so it wouldn't necessarily mean that there would be more long-term rentals automatically on the market maybe someone would be selling their unit instead if they weren't able to deal with those carrying costs anymore 
Well, I mean, I guess that would be part of the calculus that individual uh, owners would have to make, whether or not they could, uh, it, was, it was financially viable to continue maintaining uh, the unit on the long-term rental market, or whether uh, it'd, be, it'd be more viable for them to actually uh, sell the unit, more profitable for them. And so ultimately, uh, that has the, you know, the impact of uh, increasing the housing stock, uh, either, you know, through the long-term rental market or through market housing. And so ultimately, it would increase supply uh, in, in, the, in the housing market in that specific example. I thought it was interesting too that you highlighted um, the national vacancy rate and where that um, needs to be in order for prices to, to not be um, climbing maybe but prices would be more flat if they were above the um, three percent level. Am I right if it's below that then you could be seeing that pressure on on prices upwards. Yeah, certainly that's uh, that's among the metrics that are looked at to determine whether or not um, you know home home prices as well as uh, as well as uh, rental prices are going to be rising in a meaningful way more so than than incomes. But I think what's really important here to address as well is just that um, you know this is only one measure of of many measures that will help to uh, to boost supply, and uh, there are others that will have a much larger impact. So at the end of the day, uh, it really comes down to boosting the supply of housing in Canada, and uh, there's no silver bullet. So so, uh, so they're, they're all levels of government need to be acting uh, in a manner which uh, reduces barriers to building and increases that housing supply. If the short-term rentals that were out there did move over to the long-term rental market, and I, Randall, I don't know if it would have to be all of them or uh, some of them, what, what would be needed to, to move the needle, do you think, when it comes to that vacancy rate, maybe when it comes to um, you know bringing prices down a, a little bit, how, how do you? How, what's the equation there? Yeah, we didn't go through and actually estimate what the number would have to be. But if we look at what CMHC's uh, published, is that you know we need 3.5 million units over the next uh, you know of the next uh, seven eight years to 2030 in order to uh, return of you know uh, housing to to affordability. And so this is really just sort of a drop in the bucket uh, for that. It's one element to it, and something that I think could impact it in the very near term. But it's not the long run solution uh, that we need, which is really uh, building more purpose-built rentals and more market housing and increasing density in our biggest cities in order to uh, find you know affordable housing for uh, for all Canadians from doing this research Randall do you, do you have a, a recommendation when it comes to short-term rentals that that Canada could consider do you think that there shouldn't be short-term rentals or that they should be more limited or maybe like um, you know Vancouver uh, the the direction that Vancouver area went in in terms of it needing to be the the principal residence. What do, you, what do you think? I think it really comes down to the needs of individual communities and in that uh, some communities that are highly constrained in terms of housing uh, may look to uh, increasing uh, constraints on short-term rentals and to help to boost the housing supply in the near term. But others that are more tourist destinations like cottage country or, or, uh, or ski, you know, ski towns, that sort of thing, may actually desire to continue to have uh, proliferation of short-term rentals. So I think it's all about uh, local conditions and local representatives deciding uh, what's best for their community and for their residents and working uh, with higher levels of government in order to make sure that they're able to enforce the regulations that uh, they feel are necessary for uh, the, the viability of affordable housing in their communities.